Miss Rimicky was still in a bit of a glow as her class settled down. Having been waiting in the hall for her to finally show up and unlock the door with her passcode, Miss Rimicky had been playing around with the odd clothing styles that Earth had for some time now and had appeared to unlock some kind of cheat code on her human partner. Due to the rather chilly nature of space and everyone having different comfort levels, the space station was usually kept quite cold, with the only warm spots being the engineering sectors and cantinas. This was in part to not overtax their systems, and engineers just assumed everyone would wear warmer clothing outside their living quarters. Chilly temperatures usually meant that Zumra, like her, became quite lethargic, so she had been dabbling in human-made clothing that was focused around comfort and warmth. Recently, she had gotten into the large market of cabled sweaters, and this appeared to have caused something primal to arise within her human partner. It was so effective that Miss Rimicky had been several minutes late for class and had to master her breathing before she came within line of sight of her students. There were many quizzical looks from her students, as they had never seen Miss Rimicky out of breath before, and some were pondering if she had ran all the way here for some reason. This was doubly confusing because the Zumra were not particularly strong runners, being more toned and built for lifting and bearing weight. Regardless, when the students had all found themselves in their chairs and powered on their own personal digislates, Miss Rimicky once again took her position in front of the class, clapping her hands together. Good morning, everyone, Miss Rimicky said chirpily her head fronds gliding back and forth as she tilted her head with a smile. Tintle, a black furred yorpel that was having to deal with sitting next to a very excited pink optigan, raised both of her eyebrows. You appear to be in a good mood this morning, Miss Rimicky. Miss Rimicky turned to look at the yorpel, saw the glitter of mischief in her curious green eyes, then cleared her throat. <clears throat> so, what shall we speak about today? We could always of speaking about the new war against the Mandarin, the Optigan said, looking quite keen to discuss the topic. Miss Rimicky, not wanting to ruin her rather nice morning, waved a dismissive hand towards the feathered being. Aroki, I would rather not discuss such a dour subject. The massacres and killings the Mandarin have been indulging in make for a poor classroom topic. What about what they are in general? A male jinn asked, raising his hand. Miss Rimicky noticed he had multiple human tattoos along his arm, something that her people found to be rather deviant. The Mandarin race are quite new, as far as I have heard. Miss Rimicky rolled her eyes, then sat back against the front of her desk, the piece of furniture becoming quite tired of being used as a chair and its plight ignored, despite its blatant groans of annoyance. I suppose we can discuss what we know. Yes, Aroki said gleefully, causing Tintal to pin her ears back next to her. Who are they of being? Where are they of coming from? Miss Rimicky was quickly not liking Aroki being so close to the front and had a mind to give her a headache with the powers of her fronds. But she soldiered on, tapping the pads of her fingers to her palm and thumb muscle and waking up the display screen. They kept upgrading the damn thing, and it was starting to get annoying. From what we have gathered, through the very beginnings of this oddly religious, if not eugenic, war, is that the Mandarin are led by a council of religious elders and are dogmatic with nearly everything that they do. They worship a multi-armed star god named Eos and have come to eradicate both the Nimiki and the Poit though the reasons behind this are not yet known. Miss Rimicky said, bringing up a large solar map of the Cinderell Confederation. Their ability to fold in and out of space in small numbers has allowed them to actually take a few planets, but we do not believe they will be able to hold them for much longer. Aroki raised her clawed hand. But Missius Rimicky, Just miss, Aroki. Miss Rimicky said, never having been fond of the optican speaking patterns. She still didn't understand why the humans insisted they keep it either. Miss Rimicky, Aroki corrected, bringing down her clawed hand. 
but are they not of causing great and terrible damage to Yorpal and Point soldiers? They are, Miss Rimicky said, scratching at her cheek lightly. They appeared to have done their homework when planning their incursion. They use a crystallized energy weapon that infuses power into the crystal itself, allowing it to pass through any and all projectors, deflectors, shields, you name it, just cuts through it as if it was never there. This is, of course, a major issue, since the Yorpal and Poit work on nothing but that kind of armor, and the losses have been devastating, to say the least. The Carlaken and Jin have been faring a little better, but they still suffer from the speed and lack of mercy from the Mandarin. Aroki raised her hand again. But that is of the changing because of the humans. Yes, Miss Rumiki murmured, thinking of the many things that were changing due to the humans, including her spending habits. They are a wild card that the Mandarin didn't consider. According to the prisoners taken during a major counterattack on Quadra, they didn't even know the humans were still alive. The male jinn chuckled. How would they not know the humans were still around? They decimated the entire Daramir Empire. That is hard news to miss. According to them, their religious leaders said the humans had been eradicated. But why they would lie about this is anyone's guess at this point. Miss Rimicky said, tapping her brand new Zumrah-designed boots on the deck, made due to the languishing of the very cold station floor. To say that humans may carry this war would be an understatement, but there is also an issue that none of the other members of the Confederation are ready to deal with. Pride? Tintel asked with a toothy grin. Miss Rimicky actually laughed, her shoulders bucking a little as the answer caught her off guard. Why, yes, pride! The Yorpal and Poit are attempting to prove they don't need the help of the humans and are trying to bolster their own arms and armor themselves. It is not working very well, and they are constantly taking both wounded and casualties when using non-human made armor. The humans sent armor to Istin's secondary, Tintel said, leaning back in her chair. The Yorpal who tried to use it said it was too heavy or too unwieldy and went back to locally produced armor. According to them, a Yorpal will never be able to wear human-made armor. Miss Rimicky smiled brightly, her long, sharp teeth glimmering in the classroom lights, and she looked over to the butter-yellow-furred Yorpal, Ramira. Is that true? No Yorpal will ever be able to wear human-made armor? Ramira smiled but rolled her eyes, tapping her claw to her chin in mock pondering. Hmm, I don't know. I might know someone who can be an expert on the topic, though. The class all laughed, but Miss Rimicky held up her hand after a few moments. I know what I said last time we spoke about the subject, about how leaders from the Confederation wanted you to fear humans. But there is a universal truth that everyone knows now more than they did during the Daramir War. What's that? Oroki asked, her avian eyes wide. Miss Rimicky crossed her legs as she sat fully on her desk now the large draconic muscles visible even through her jeans. That humans are, by and large, the most wanted ally in the Confederation. Many would say galaxy, but that may be giving them too much credit. Why? Tintel asked. Because they can never find it in themselves to say no. Miss Rimicky replied. If they call you a friend or ally, they can never find it in themselves to deny you. Yorpal and Point capital ships will, at times, ignore distress calls and send out smaller ships to assist. Carlaken and Jin capital ships will outright refuse. A female Jin spluttered out, raising her hand. W well of course they would. A capital ship is a mighty fleet asset. You can't send capital ships off to deal with emergency broadcasts. That's what dreadnoughts and destroyers are for. Oh, Miss Rimicky mused, bouncing her upper leg off of her lower leg's knee, despite the languishing of her desk. Then why would humans divert an entire battleship, which are nearly the size of capital ships, to deal with any and all broadcasts they receive? No questions asked, no reason needed, 
and they do it simply because their allies need help. The djinn held out her four hands. Well, because they wouldn't. They would just send out a destroyer or something to deal with the threat. What race would commit an entire capital ship to a single emergency broadcast? What race indeed, Miss Rimiki said, raising the ridge of scales that formed her eyebrows. Who would care that much about their allies and the smallest among us? So these are just for six-man squats, Frerin asked, knocking her knuckle against one of the RIACs staged up in another section of the drop bay. Himmel nodded. Yep, rapid infantry assault capsules. If you thought the big Higgins were launched fast, these will re-bleach your teeth white. From what I hear, these things fire a huge rocket when it is close to the ground. Zetrin murmured, also gazing at the rather fancy-looking capsule. From launch to landing, we can react to an emergency distress signal within ten minutes. Frerin whistled, then stuck out the tip of her tongue to talk like the Carlegan. That's fast. Himmel chuckled, though Zetrin rolled his eyes. Very funny, Frerin, he said giving her a hard shove and sending the smaller Yorpel cackling and stumbling along the flight deck. The RIACs were not new, but were starting to be used more and more to the point they were being produced at double the rate of the Higgins due to the lightning raids being performed by the Mandarin. The Mandarins were trying to avoid the humans as much as possible now that they were trying to raid within the same space and were trying to fold around the war wave heading towards the main front of this religious war of zealotry. The big mouth bass was on patrol around the edges of Yorpal and Point space, and most of the training that the new recruits on board still needed was being administered on the ship instead. It was during one of these breaks that Frerin, Himmel, and Zetrin found themselves all in the same spot and had been catching up while admiring the Yaks, as they were nicknamed. Apparently, Ryaks, sounded stupid despite it being accurate to the acronym, and the humans didn't like it. Instead, they went with naming it after a key side effect of coming down through Atmo at the speed these capsules did. So do you guys want to get some food? Pretty sure tonight is taco night, Himmel said, squatting down to read a small metal plate label on the yak. Zetrin smiled, leaning his hooded head back. Ah, tacos. I do like tacos. They always make my face fur so messy, Frerin muttered. Can't they just always serve pizza? What is with you, Yorbul, and your afflictions with pizza? Zetrin asked her with a hissing laugh. You have to learn to eat other foods. Frerin's retort died in her throat as amber lights strobed to life across the ceiling and the armory swung open with a loud clang of their doors being forced open by emergency hydraulic pressers. So much for tacos, Zetrin pouted. They're coming, Zerilli shouted, the point ducking down as three orange crystals split the air over his head. I got a message through the jammers. They're coming. A magenta Yorpal male shrugged down beside the point, both of them huddling behind their covers, as the Gauss carbine vented steam across their faces. You also said our own damned ships would be coming nearly an hour ago. Humans always come. They'll be dropping into our atmosphere in ten minutes. Zerilli screamed, both of their heads getting covered in shards of orange crystals as the metal crates they were hiding behind were struck multiple times. The magenta Yorpal looked around, his eye rectical glittering with light as it fed him information, and he turned around into a kneeling crouch. Magwa? Yes, Fink? A voice screamed into his ear. The female Yorpal's voice strained beyond hope with fear. Bring your claw over here. We need to group up. Humans are on their way, Fink shouted, then loomed over the cover he was behind and fired multiple spikes of ammunition towards the mandarin positions to at least get them to duck their heads. Help is coming! Humans? Thank goodness! Now I actually believe you! Magua shouted back into his ear, 
and Fink could hear the thundering of Yorpel and Point Feet behind him. There was a scream of horror, and Zerilli watched as several large orange crystals split through the Point riflemen, the reinforced armor suit and vibro decelerators doing nothing to stop the long munitions. The Point ragdolled to the ground in a tangle of limbs, her inertia carrying her in a fouled roll that saw her spine nearly bend all the way backwards. Tin's teeth! Zerilli cursed in shock as the Yorpal was a little slow getting behind their own cover, an orange crystal splitting his head open like an overripe fruit. The crystal didn't even slow down after leaving the crumbling body behind and sank deeply into the chest of another Yorpal that had been behind the first. The purple male let out a howl of agony as he was pinned to a water canister. He's drowning! Zerilli screamed as he leapt to his feet, the water canister splitting open and water boarding the screaming Yorpal. Fink jerked backwards and snatched Zerilli by the collar of his combat suit, then dragged him back behind cover. Leave him! He's in the open! He's going to die like that! Zerilli screamed, clawing at Fink to try and get the Yorpal's gloved paw off of him. Six crystals shrieked through the air and embedded themselves within the pinned Yorpal, the body armor and shields doing nothing to keep the crystals at bay. Zerilli fell to a knee as the Yorpal convulsed against the water canister a few times, as if the body was trying to jerk itself free. He stilled, hanging there in the air as water flowed over his body, his paws dangling just a few inches above the wet ground. Why? Zerilli whispered over the din of the firefight. Why do... Why do none of the shields work? Fink growled under his breath, finally managing to bring down a mandarin by sinking a gauss spike through his armpit, then shrank down behind their cover. I don't know, Point. They had all been stationed on Maneski as a deterrent to raiders, as that branch of mandarins mostly attacked lightly defended areas and at least lacked heavy armor. This time, the raiders had brought regulars with them. Not only did they have strong weapons, but their weird bodysuits of armor were also quite adept at stopping nearly everything they could throw at them. This whole fight had started at a docking area for commerce, and they had been pushed all the way back to a storage area filled with crates and other shipping containers. Losses were mounting quickly, as despite the best attempts of the Poit and Yorpal, they still could not produce a suit of armor that could even slow those damned crystals. How much longer until the humans arrive? Fink asked Zerilli, pulling out a battery pack and replacing the drained one in his Gauss carbine. Zerilli pulled out his data slate, then let out a relieved puff of breath. They've just entered orbit. Get in the yaks, go, go, go! Sergeant Mackey screamed, still pulling his helmet from the armory rack. Just get in there, now! Frerin pulled on her suit of torso armor, then held up her hands to catch her helmet as Himmel tossed it to her on the run. Zetrin was already running down the drop line, the RIACs trundling along launchers and getting into position along their speed rails. This one, Zetrin called out, attaching his rifle to his chest as he started climbing the loader ladder. The gallant lady. Hope she's a strong woman, Himmel muttered through his helmet mic as he started climbing after Zetrin, though he had a 40 millimeter grenade launcher strapped to his chest. Funnily enough, Despite all the high-tech bells and whistles and all the advancements through the arms and armory, the 40 millimeter grenade launcher was still a mainstay of nearly every military on Earth. Himmel liked it purely because of the sound it made. Frerin pulled her helmet over her ears and head, then quickly scrambled up the ladder, her shoot paws making quick work of the rungs. Wait up for us, Marwak called out, the djinn and two other humans coming up the ladder with him. Frerin's helmet was already loading their infantry information and creating a roster for them, and command would already know who was leading who before the capsules even launched. The dagger-like capsules started to hum as its systems came online and light flooded the intimate passenger space. There were only six racks in the yaks and had nearly three times the amount of dampening equipment as the Higgins threes. The seats were all arranged around the core of the capsule, facing egress doors that sprang open by two steel rods being launched into them. Frerin quickly looked around while her rack locked onto her armor and lifted her off the capsule deck. Six seats, three doors. They would be springing out in pairs. The blade of these capsules, or the tip as many called it, 
were made of solid metal and alloys that would allow the capsule to stick into the ground, locking it in place. Near the top of the capsule were the rockets, which looked much like the pommel of a dagger, now that Freren remembered. The long spike of the drag array deployers looked like a handle, and if she thought about it, the ship would look like it was throwing a bunch of high-tech knives at the planet. She wasn't sure why, but it made her chuckle. Yaks are all loaded and personnel accounted for. All the other personnel in drop bay leave now. Emergency drop in progress, the dockmaster called out into all their helmets, and Frering could see dozens of shadows moving at speed towards the bay doors. They were all now dangling just above the deck and wiggling back and forth as the yak was brought under tension, and Zetrin had his tail wrapped around his leg. No personnel found in the drop bay. Drop bay venting for launch, the dockmaster said and Freren could hear the yak spooling up and already putting power into the dampeners. Oh, this is going to suck, Freren said quietly, and everyone around her agreed with laughter. Himmel held up a finger. I for one believe that this is not only going to suck, but it is going to... How do you humans put it, Marcus? It is going to suck balls, Himmel, Marcus replied, shaking his tanned head. Unlocking capsules for launch! the dockmaster said, and amber light filled the yaks. There was no handy-dandy light changer in these, just amber light and the glow from the T-visors of the helmets worn by the passengers. All yaks showing green. Go for air, boss. Unlike the Higgins pods, the only reply was a loud, ear-ringing buzzer that made everyone's teeth hurt, and then the sudden rush of their blood all trying to fit within their skulls. Holy fuck! Freren screamed out as they were propelled at three times the speed from the bottom of the big mouth bass, their capsules actually leaving a trail of smoke and elements behind them as if they were thrown through a cloud of fog. Now looking back on it, Freren and the rest of her friend group would all agree that screaming for as long as they did was a bit of a rookie move. Their armor technicians also made a note that they nearly destroyed their inner helmet microphones from how loud they were screaming and had caused a little bit of damage to the receivers as well. The speed of the yaks was utterly terrifying, and Freren didn't even have a chance to really even catch her breath before the yak began shuddering like mad as it sliced into the atmosphere. On mission! was all Freren could think to yell out, keeping her eyes squeezed shut as the yak began to display an impact timer on a screen above them. Get a hold of yourselves! Speak for yourself, Corporal! Himmel shouted in a voice devoid of breath. I think my nuts are somewhere on the ceiling! Zetron managed to open an eye and saw the screen quickly trilling with numbers. Landing in two minutes! Freren was bouncing back and forth so much that she wondered if this was how the mixing ball in a cocktail shaker felt, and she was so tensed that her abdominal muscles were nearly showing through her fur under the suit. The yak sounded a loud buzzer, and Freren snapped her eyes open to look at the screen. She felt the craft shudder as the drag arrays were finally deployed, and she felt her blood now rush to her damn paws. 30 seconds! The buzzer then began to rattle their teeth every 10 seconds, and at the last 10 seconds, the boosters kicked on with a stomach-curling lurch. Freren let out a ragged gasp as the dagger-shaped capsule slammed into the ground, the impact so jarring that she had chipped not just one, but three of her teeth. The yak let out one last formidable klaxon call, then the three doors of the capsule slammed open with the impact of their launching rods, and sunlight filled the capsule. Freren's shoot paws hit the deck, and she took off at a run, slipping in front of Marwok and ripping her XC-1 lancer from her chest and immediately bringing it up to her eye. They had landed amongst the enemy, and she could tell by their armor that these mandarins were regulars. Himmel came to a skidding halt, having come out of the capsule nearly face-to-face -face with a mandarin melee specialist and fired a snapshot with his grenade launcher. Humans, believing in safety, of course, had a minimal arming distance on 40 millimeter grenades. This meant that instead of exploding and killing both Himmel and the Mandarin, it instead just removed the Mandarin's head by brute force, throwing brain and skull fragments into the air like a macabre confetti popper filled with pearly meat bolognese. Marcus came off their ramp and body checked his own Mandarin, 
the human pulling out a dagger and sinking it straight into the man's face with little paws, despite his mouth filling with blood. He had bitten his tongue on landing and had no idea how to spit it out within the helmet. Frarin's knees buckled as three more capsules hit the ground around her, and she toppled over into the dirt as three launching klaxons vibrated the air, followed by the sounds of their ramps hitting the ground. She quickly got to her feet and took in the situation, bringing up her rifle and putting a bullet straight through the forehead of a female mandarin, trying to bring up some kind of beam weapon. They had landed where the coordinates were, some kind of loading area, but she heard the cries of their allies from behind her. Everyone on me, Frarin called out, then took off at a run towards a large gathering of crates, moving equipment, and a few low-altitude shuttles. Marcus and Marwak were the first to come beside her, while Zetrin and Himmel came in just behind them. Where's Jersey? Frarin asked out as she hurtled over a shattered water container that had a dead Yorpel still pinned to it. Marcus's voice keyed into her ear. Dead. Caught on one of those crystals to the face and put his lights out. Shit! Frarin spat, then pulled her slammer from her belt as Marcus and Marwak did the same. Slammers were, for all intents and purposes, just a single-handed war hammer that sported a claw hammer face and a curved spike on the other end. The difference between these and their ancestral kin were that the strike face of these hammers could be triggered by an internally powered mechanism, allowing the strike faces to be propelled forward a few inches at speeds of over a hundred miles per hour. These were found to be highly efficient at shattering the bodies of the Mandarin, despite their armor, and it was going to be the first time Frarin got to use one in anger. Her team loomed into view of a sprawling melee, and it was not going well for anyone not a Mandarin. A point was screaming out in terror as a Mandarin tried to force a blade down towards his chest, while a magenta Yorpal was already staggering backwards from two swipes to his chest, his fur leaking blood like a busted hose as he fired his Gauss carbine on full auto, riddling a massive Mandarin's armor with spikes. Frarin wasted no time, bringing back her slammer and triggering the inner mechanism. She brought it across the back of the Mandarin's skull, and the warhammer let out a hissing thud, cracking open the Mandarin's skull and spattering it across the point. The point let out a scream and scrambled out from underneath the leaking Mandarin, all while Frarin jumped deftly over them both, firing her rifle with one hand and readying her slammer with the other. Marcus shoulder-checked the spike-riddled Mandarin and threw off the aim of his humming blade, sparring the magenta yorpal of the killing blow that had been coming down toward his neck. Not to be made a slouch, the Yorpa pulled out a combat knife and sank it into the Mandarin's thigh, matching the time required for Marcus to bring his own slammer around and turn the Mandarin's heart to ragu within his chest. Zetrin, fueled by bloodlust and empowered by human combat armor, whipped his tail around and sent a female Mandarin smashing against a crate, his own slammer out and already shattering another Mandarin's shoulder. Marwak let out a war cry and jumped, sinking a heavy boot into the chest of a mandarin, wielding some kind of odd power spear. The melee was fierce, and by the time Frarin could take a moment to catch her breath, her armor had been slashed three times by power blades, and her helmet was giving her an alert that her knee armor was compromised. Himmel spotted a group of riflemen heading their way, their glowing weapons keeping them well lit and visible, and launched a 40 millimeter grenade their way with a soft thump of the weapon's report. This grenade was properly armed when it landed and exploded with a dull thud of shrapnel, shredding the mandarin and sending them stumbling to the ground with multiple bleeds. Th thank you, Zerilli gasped out, reaching up and taking the clawed hand of Zetrin, who was bleeding from his fifth arm wound. You came. Humans always come. Marcus said with a nod, then turned when he heard the magenta yorpal hissing out in painful laughter. I guess that part is true then, Fank muttered, and he looked around with a disheartened sigh. We got butchered. Frarin blinked up at her helmet display until she found the right channel. I need medics to point Lima. En route. A female voice came back to her, calm and collected. Frarin nodded to the other yorpal. They're coming. Thank you. Go I. The Yorpals said through gritted teeth, nodding to her respectively, as Frarin grimaced, unseen from inside her helmet. 
Kahuai was the name used for Yorpal who strayed from the ancestral path and was a name given to all the Yorpal who had left to train with the humans. Yet here was this one, saying it to her with reverence. Corporal Freren, head to Point Alpha, Sergeant Mackey said into Freren's ear. Freren nodded as a new directional heading appeared in her visor, and she holstered her slammer on her belt. Let's go, fellas. We have Mandarin to kill, and they are trying to hold a docking station. Let's get going, then, Zetrin growled, having not been satisfied in only killing four Mandarin. My blood is swarm. Freren and her team took off at a dead sprint across their landing site, crossing paths with the two medics running the opposite way, then came over the top of a pathway where a chaotic firefight was evolving. Himmel! There! Freren barked out, pointing her finger to a cluster of Mandarin, who were manning two crew-served weapons, the bright purple beams hissing through the air with heat. Her helmet picked up where she was pointing, traced the finger, then lit up Himmel's own helmet display with an amber square, showing him where Freren wanted him to shoot. Gladly. Himmel muttered, raising his launcher and slamming a high-yield boiler round into the tube, firing without delay. The 40-millimeter grenade sailed through the air and hit dead center of the Mandarin position, exploding out in a huge plume of white smoke and burning orange phosphorus. Enjoy a visit from Willie, you know helmet-wearing dumbasses. The keening screams of the Mandarin were audible, even through Freren's helmet as they ran past their position. The people within the cloud burning alive from the white phosphorus, burning holes through their flesh and choking their lungs. Freren came down a long roadway for trucks and managed to loop around a shallow warehouse, coming down into the flank of an entrenched Mandarin position. She went to lean out when a human XC-1 Lancer skipped across the top of her helmet, and she ripped herself backwards in a panic. Shit! Freren howled, her helmet letting out a few trilling warnings. Corporal Freren is at Point Alpha! Point Alpha, damn it! An unfamiliar voice hit her ears, though it was at least apologetic. Our bad. We had to give some of the point rifles. They can't see our readouts. We'll tell them not to shoot me, Freren growled, waving her hand towards Himmel. Himmel, get up there and hit those bastards. High explosive. Himmel shoved the 40 millimeter round into his launcher, then stepped around Freren with his visor showing him the landing location. Hi, diddly ho, fuck boys. Freren rolled her eyes even as Himmel launched the round, then lurched around the corner with her team in tow. You really need to stop going on the human message boards. That's where all the best memes are, Corporal, Marwak said, and everyone in her team grinned as Freren let out an anguished rumble in her throat. Freren and her team hit a jumble of scattered mini conexes and crates, bringing up their rifles and slamming home the door on the L-shaped firing line. Freren was pounding a mandarin in her chest with munitions when the mandarin turned and fired wildly the rifle far larger and meaner looking than the ones the raiders from before had. The orange crystal sang through the air and embedded itself in her shoulder armor, penetrating all the way down to her flesh. Freren let out a scream and was jerked around by the inertia of the munition, ripping her feet out from under her and causing her to slam into the concrete. It's burning! Freren screamed, clawing at the massive crystal in her shoulder. Get it out of me! It's burning! Corporal Freren is hit! Himmel shouted as Zetrin gripped the orange crystal with his clawed hands, pulling it out of Freren with a shriek of metal and a guttural glut of it leaving a massive hole in her flesh. Zetrin threw the crystal down, and it rang away with a spin, sending flecks of Freren's blood spinning off across the concrete. The Karlaken had helped the Yorpal to her feet with a jerk of his arm. Still able to fight? Zetrin asked Freren, hefting his rifle and laying down suppressive fire. Freren's chest plate gave a hum as it injected her with the painkillers and wound tech, and she gave her head a shake. That sucked, but I can keep going. Just can't use that arm for now. Her visor display warned her that her flesh and muscles had been heavily damaged, and her armor zipped her arm to her side with a whine of the micromotors, locking it in place as the undersuit inflated to support the arm. Freren hauled her rifle up onto the crate and kept firing, Marcus beside her, and hammering away with his own weapon. Frag out! Sergeant Mackey called out over the unit communications, and dozens of little amber squares filled Freren's visor as the other teams threw grenades. <laughs> That's going to suck for them. 
Frerin laughed, and she held up her rifle for Marcus. The human slammed a new magazine home for her, and Frerin started firing again, even as a concussive ripple of exploding grenades tore the air apart with the hiss and zing of shrapnel. The fight dwindled after that, as even these more heavily armored Mandarin could not withstand the pure weight of force that was human heavy assault armor. There were, however, more KIA than before, but the ratio was far, far in favor of the human infantry. Even the big mouth bass got in on the action, the flights of fighters, getting to engage in aerial dogfights with Mandarin fighters as the massive battleship took Mandarin raiding cutters to the sword. Frerin could even still see the flaming wrecks of Mandarin ships flaming and glittering in the atmosphere when they came to pick up both her and the other troopers, ferrying them up to the big mouth bass when the battle was all over, and the Mandarin having folded away to safer space. While the shuttles landed down onto the now liberated dockyards, Frerin looked at her team. Marcus had two leg wounds. Himmel was somehow free of injury. Zetrin had multiple arm bleeds. Marwak had caught a crystal to the hip, and Jersey had died only a few seconds after landing. She chuckled to herself, then slowly pulled off her helmet, tucking it between her knees and running her good hand through her hair. What a day. Ten-hour combat action? Not too shabby, Himmel said, taking off his helmet as well. Shame that all of you got shot. Marcus blew out a laugh. That's because you're so short, everyone sees us first. Get over it, Link Leg, Himmel teased, then blew a raspberry as Marcus messed up his hair with his massive hand. Zetrin sniffed, pulling off his helmet as well, when Marwak opened his fresh air ports. Ten Mandarin killed this day. Brings me to fifteen. Not bad numbers, Marwak said, rolling his shoulders. Shame about Jersey. I only just met him a few days ago. His number got pulled. Nothing we could do about it. Marcus murmured, watching as the shuttles started deploying their ramps and ferret shuttles started pulling yaks from the ground. Well, time to go home. Frerin stood up, her wounded arm still tight to her side, as she locked her XC-1 into place on her chestplate. Ah, yeah, another day, another dollar. Himmel, Zetrin, Marwak, and Marcus laughed good-naturedly as they all stood up with Frerin, and they slowly made their way towards the shuttle. They had just sat down into the seats of the shuttle when Frerin let out a sigh, hanging her mustard-yellow furred head backwards. What? Himmel asked, unloading his 40 millimeter and putting the round back into his bandolier. Frerin bared her teeth, closing her eyes. It's still taco night. Oh, for goodness sakes. Zetrin hissed out in an incredulous laugh. You've been shot in the shoulder. And now your entire day is ruined because it's taco night? Marcus shrugged. The Navy guys got to do some action. Maybe you'll get lucky and they'll make pizza to celebrate. Frerin's head shot up, her ears perked. You think so? They've done it before, Marcus said. Arielis, a lanky female human, nodded her bald head. It's true. The granny leg had a pizza party after they destroyed the Mandarin cruiser. Hope filled Frerin's chest as they lifted away from the planet and headed back home. But after being seen to by the medical staff, it was still taco night. Frerin pouted from within the defect as everyone around her celebrated with their many tacos and burritos and drank margaritas in salute to their fellow fallen warriors. She had tried to make something called a tostada or something of the sort, but it just wasn't the same. Despite her journey on the yaks and being shot, this was by far the worst part of her day. That was until her sister Ramira had a video call with her, and Frerin saw both her and her friend Tintel were eating deep-dish Chicago-style pizza, and it was all she could do to hold back her frustrated tears.